I request uh, uh, Dr. Arun Kumar Nayak to deliver the second foundation lecture. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Odisha Economic Association, Professor Patra, Professor Amarendra. Uh, so kind, both of you, to invite me for this uh, very, very interesting talk, which I have been uh, discussing, deliberating over the years. Let me tell you, for the last uh, two, three years, I've been thinking about it. And it's a nice platform to debate it, as you rightly said. At the same time, let me also thank all of you who have joined uh, through video conferencing. This is Sunday evening, and I'm really sorry keeping a hold for next one hour, 30 minutes. Uh, but there, there was no other way, but I applied. At the same time, I request your kind attention uh, for this talk. So what I'm going to speak here is uh, energy security for a $35 trillion decarbon India 2047. I think Professor Pat Patra has uh, rightly brought it out that uh, there are two aspects involved. One aspect is, uh, you know, that we are ambitious country. 1947, India was born, and uh, 2047 is 100 years after that. And we say at the end of the Amrutkal, 2047, the vision for India is to be a developed nation. And not only developed, we will be one of the largest economy with $35 trillion. At the same time, there is a bell which has rang. The bell is the right side one you have seen. The rising sea level, submerging villages in Odisha, global warming districts uh, could tell that sea level to go rise and many poor districts can go below sea water and so on and so forth. There is a big challenge. And that big challenge is because of the climate change, global warming, and to safeguard that, like other nations, we have also taken a commitment to decarbon our energy sector. So there is a competitive thing. Thing is that we have to increase our economy to $35 trillion. At the same time, there is a challenge that we have to decarbon India. So this competing thing, what options left for India? And this is hardly 20 years left down the line. How to accomplish is the challenge and that's what I'm going to talk here. Next slide. Yes, as I said, end of Amrutkal, we imagine India to be a developed nation. What do you mean by developed nation? The World Bank says today India's per capita income is just above $2,500, in fact, close to $2,600, and it must surpass $21,664 by 2047 if we have to classify India as a high-income nation. So if you look at today, our economy is $3.7 trillion. It has climbed by 10 times. And there is also closely related to the per capita income has to grow from $2,500 to $21,664, eight times. And there is also a burdening effect on us. Today, our population is $1.4 billion. By mid of the century, I can say 2047, another 30 crore people have to join us. So we'll be 1.7 billion population by mid of the century. So all planning, everything has to be done with regard to that. And uh, for that, what the Reserve Bank of says, that India has to grow at the rate of something like 7.6% per year for next 25 years. But if inflation is considered, it's much higher will be either of 10.6% per year. And to accomplish such a huge economic growth, the energy growth has to be also proportional to support this. And there is a climate change, which is directly impacting to the energy growth. Why? Because today's energy is primarily comes from carbon-based sources, that is fossil-based sources. So we have to decarbon India by replacing coal, oil, and gas, which is more than 90% of today's energy supply. That is 0.1. At the same time, we have to increase the energy to support the $35 trillion. So these are the competing things 
which we have to accomplish in the next 22 years. Next slide, please. So, it's a beautiful slide. What I have done, I've just plotted the topmost slide, if you see, from 1960 to 2022, two aspects. One is how our GDP has climbed. At the same time, how our energy, that is primary energy, also has climbed. So, GDP, if you see, 1962 it was very small. It was hardly 40 uh, billion dollars. And today, as I said, we are close to 3,700 billion dollars, 3.7 trillion dollars. So, it has climbed several times in the last uh, 60 years. And similarly, if you look at our total primary energy consumption, that also has climbed up similar order in the last 60 years to support the GDP growth rate. If you look at the bottom most one, that shows how our per capita income has changed. Per capita income 1962 was very small. And I said today it is just uh, uh, around 2,600 US dollar per capita per head. Now, what is the amount of energy we will be requiring by if we want to accomplish a 35 uh, trillion dollar? That is what I put in the right side graph. It is a basically, it is a something like I will say that imagination, or you can say it is a basically computation, or it is something that comes out from modeling. But what I have done from uh, 1962 till 2022, I have plotted the x-axis as the GDP, y-axis is the primary energy consumption in terms of billions of units per year. And today, you look at, we are just close to 10,000 billion units, that is terawatt hour per year. This is total energy that India consumes. And if I extrapolate the same graph and add 35 trillion dollar economy, we will be requiring something like 50 to 60,000 total primary energy consumption in terms of terawatt hour per year, which will be roughly five to six times of today's total energy consumption. This number, please remember, if you have to accomplish 35 trillion dollar economy by mid of the century, we need something like 50 to 60,000 terawatt hour per year or 50 to 60,000 billion units of electricity to support that. So today we are 10,000. We have to climb at least five to six times. Next slide, please. As I said, if you look at topmost, whether you are able to see or not, even today, we are the third largest consumer of energy in the world, apart from China and America. We are the third largest. But we have a problem. Our population is 1.4 billion. So if I take the per capita energy consumption in terms of kilowatt hour per person, the bottom most line is that for India. And today it's just 7,000 units per person in India per year. Even China consumes four times that of us today. And other developed countries like United States 11 times and other nations 15 times, 22 times. So how much energy will be requiring? So today, as I said, we consume 10,000 terawatt hour per year, and China consumes today itself four times more than us. And if we reach 35 trillion dollar economy, my estimate is we have to grow at least five to six times of this energy. Next. So this is what I really something we have to worry. In the United States, what I say, more than 80% of Americans have flown in a plane. But in India, large fraction of India are yet to catch a flight. Something like 90% Indians today are waiting to catch a flight. So in the developed India, what do you imagine? Everybody will be going in a flight. And if you look at how many Western world people own a car, almost if you go to Europe and America, everyone is having at least one car. And in India, large fraction of India are yet to do that. 90% Indian households are yet to get advanced domestic appliances like air conditions, refrigerators, and so on. In addition, urbanization is expected to grow something like 51% by mid of this century. And what the experts say, if you want to accomplish 
all these things will requiring the power system of the size of European Union, what is there today, we need to have add in India every year to have to accomplish a $35 trillion economy. Next slide. Even with the present 10,000 terawatt hour per year, forget about 50,000, 60,000 to support the $35 trillion economy, the biggest story is the greenhouse gas emissions. And this primarily because almost 90% of our total energy is consumed by fossil fuels, which emit all those gases, CO2, nitrogen oxide, methane, and all. And that is what is today's story. Next. So this is a very, very interesting slide. A professor known as Japanese professor, Shikuro Manabe, he has predicted in the year, I think, 1960s, that how much the earth is going to warm if we add the CO2 concentration in the year, in the air. And in the year 2001, he got the Nobel Prize for that. What it says, the two takeaways, I request everyone can remember this number, they can share it with their family members. If the CO2 concentration in the earth doubles, the rise of the earth temperature is going to by 2.36 degrees Celsius. Please remember, if the CO2 is doubled, the earth is going to rise, the temperature of the earth is going to rise by 2 degrees Celsius almost. And if you take out the CO2 from the air by half, it's going to fall down by 2 degrees Celsius. So choice is ours, how much temperature we want to increase by adding more and more CO2. Next slide. Why should we bother about 2 degrees Celsius? Is there a fantasy or there is a science behind that? The 2 degrees Celsius limit was endorsed by a council of German scientists who were advising Angela Merkel, the then environmental minister of Germany. So what broadly they think, the human civilization had developed in a period when the sea level remained stable, agriculture or bio habitats could flourish. And that requires that two degrees Celsius has to be respected. But initially the critics grumbled that two degrees Celsius is very arbitrary. But later on scientists could produce evidence that if you go above 2 degrees Celsius, there is a rapid rise in sea level, risk of crop failure, coral, or you can say there is a big threat to the habitats of the planet. And by 2009, nearly every government has endorsed a 2 degrees Celsius limit. What will happen? Suppose the Earth's temperature rises 1.4 degrees Celsius, 4.4 degrees Celsius, almost three times. What happens? The precipitation is going to rise by almost 3.5 times, 2.4% or 8.3%. Sea level can rise by two times. Worst thing is the Arctic ice, which can melt, and it's going to increase by eight times. So remember, just by increasing the Earth's temperature by from 1.4 to 4.4 degrees Celsius, worst is the Arctic sea ice melt which is going to happen by eight times. And below the Arctic ice, there are billion tons of CO2 is already stored. If the ice melts, you don't have to burn CO2, sorry, fossil fuels to produce CO2. The CO2 will automatically come to the atmosphere. Next. So the climate change, its biggest impact. What the right side one is a very recent study. What it says, the last uh, 22 years, India has lost alone $120 billion or $1.2 trillion because of the climate disaster. And the risk is mainly from physical phenomena like floods or the uh, crops damage and which also affect India's business. And what the experts say that if no action is taken again to mitigate the climate risk. India could lo lose something like 7.14 lakhs crores of rupees per year. And stan uh, standards and uh, standard chartered bank says it could be of the order much higher, 22 lakh crore rupees per year. We can lose per year. Next slide. 
So this is a very, very interesting slide. What is the choice? How much time is left for us? The topmost slide, if you see, in 1990, the globe was globally, the CO2 emission equivalent or greenhouse gas emission was the, of the order of 40 billion tons of CO2 per year. How much? 40 billion tons in a year. And today, 2020, it has climbed from 40 to 60 billion tons of CO2 per year. And the climate experts have predicted that if you want to limit the global temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius, how much the Earth's CO2 budget? It is only 400 to 500 billion tons. And if I divide that by 60, assuming no more further increase in CO2 addition to the atmosphere, the time left is only 8 to 10 years. In fact, by end of this decade, the Earth is going to, uh, the temperature of Earth is going to rise by 1.5 degrees Celsius. And if you want to limit to 2 degrees Celsius, the Earth's budget of CO2 is not much. It's 1150 to 1350 billion tons. And if I divide that by 60, the time left is 20 years. So by 2047, we are burning a next generation that your habitat on this planet is threatened because the two degrees Celsius temperature could rise. And 2047, we are also asking the next generation to improve the economy so that it reaches $35 trillion. So this is the from the past two slides. Now come to the next right topmost. Who is emitting how much CO2 if they produce one unit of electricity? The United States, if they produce one unit of electricity, they, re they release something like half a kg of CO2. China close to 700 grams of CO2. India is one of the highest, let me tell you, close to 800 grams of CO2 we emit per one unit of electricity. United Kingdom, 350 grams of CO2. And France, one of the lowest, it's a 90 grams of CO2 per one unit of electricity. It is all because in France, 68% 60 of electricity is produced from nuclear. What the international energy analysis has put a target. If you want to limit your two degrees Celsius limit, if you want to produce one unit of electricity, the max to max CO2 you can release has to be less than 11 grams. The MIT, United States, says that no, 11 grams is still so high. It should not be more than one gram of CO2 per one unit of electricity, which is very, very difficult, challenging, no technology today supports. So what technology options we are having that I have shown at the bottom, that the qualifying energy systems is only two. One is nuclear, another is hydro. No other technology, including solar, can give us something like 11 grams of CO2 for one unit of electricity. In fact, the solar PV gives 40 grams of CO2, more than 40 grams of CO2 for one unit of electricity. Next slide. And the other biggest challenge for India is the carbon tax implications. The carbon border taxes have already started and that has become a threat, especially India's steel exports and other similarly other materials which are produced by burning coal. And that could impact our exports, exports something like 15 to 40 percent in the forthcoming years. And the European Union, how much tax they are going to put is something like 60 to 165 dollars per ton of steel. And then steel we can never export to Europe, European Union. It will be too expensive to send there. And if you look at the right side, it's very interesting. I have downloaded just two days back. The carbon tax revenues have, which have been collected in other nations, India is going to do that also. France is one of the highest. It's close to $80 billion last year. The tax revenue has come because of the carbon taxes. Next is Canada and so on. So the Europe and America has already started charging the carbon tax if you burn fossil fuels. Next. India is also in the Gazette of India is trying to publish similar thing that the carbon credit or carbon taxes. What United Kingdom is doing today that they have started something like carbon pricing 
which is today something like 40 to 100 pounds if we emit one ton of CO2 or that is today and by mid of the century what they say it will be 100 to 300 pounds if we emit one ton of CO2. And if I translate that in terms of electricity, that means you are producing electricity from coal, oil and gas. You have to pay 4 to 10 rupees extra for one unit of electricity today and it will translate to 10 rupees to 30 rupees by mid of this century. So these are our burdens which are coming up. Next slide. So at COP26, we all know we committed many things. The most important one, the 2070 will achieve the net zero. I don't know whether we'll be really surviving 2070 if we keep on burning coal, oil, gas, but this is our today's target. Next. So what options are left? Many times we say solar, wind, hydro, bio, which are the renewable sources can meet our energy demand. I said today, if you remember the number, we consume 10,000 terawatt hour per year. And if we want to be a $35 trillion economy by 2047, we say we require 50 to 60,000 terawatt hour per year. Now, what is the renewable potential for India? Renewable means what God has given to our soil. Solar, there are many models I'm not going to discuss, is hardly 2,000 terawatt hour per year. Wind is another 1,000. Hydro is another 1,000. Bio is very small. All together, if I add, it's only 40% of today's total energy consumption. God has given us the potential for renewables on this soil. Next slide. So what is the energy balance sheet for India? I said 40% of today's total energy consumption, if we completely utilize the renewables, we can get. What about remaining 60%? There is a big number. And what I say, suppose by mid of the century, we make improvements in the energy efficiency, smart grids, excellent storage systems, probably 4,000, let's assume 8,000. Still, to meet today's energy consumption, there is a balance of 2,000 terawatt hour per year. And if you want to have a $35 trillion economy, the balance is huge, 30,000 terawatt hour per year, which is four times of today's total energy consumption. And I, if I uh, find out what is in terms of electricity, it's something like 5,000 gigawatt electricity. Next. Another worry for us, the coal plants have to retire. And especially this is today's government policy, those coal plants we have to have aged in terms of their life, they have to retire. There is no need of extension. So my estimate is that by 2047 or 2050, almost 200 gigawatt electricity coal will be off the grid, which is today's electricity supplier. Next slide. What America has done? America has started about coal to nuclear transition. And they have found that almost 400 coal plants can be the home to nuclear in the next and producing something like 250 gigawatt. And the bottom graph you see is basically an American study. Suppose you built a 100 megawatt and close to 1000 megawatt, how much the employment can be generated if you replace a coal plant to nuclear plant? There is significant number of population which can be employed, which ranges from to, uh, close to 30 to almost 60 or 100 additional people can be employed. So the American study says that almost by 2030, 30% of their coal plants are retiring and that will give home to almost 400 sites for nuclear power plants. And these sites, they can reuse because 35% of the existing infrastructure they can use and that will also can produce something like 86%. This can be a repowered, saving something like $275 million economy. So this is a beautiful thing, retire, reuse, and repower by transforming the coal to nuclear. Next slide. Another big problem for India, which this is not problem, this is my uh, estimate, that if you look at captive power plants, which today drive 
the steel industry, cement industry, chemical industry, metallurgical industry, mineral industry, mining industry in India, in the last 10 years or 80 years, the power consumption has gone something like 30 gigawatt to 80 gigawatt, almost two times. And these are small size plants. And the experts say that if India has to be a developed nation, the steel industry will go by eight times. Cement has to go by three times. And the corresponding power requirement, very modestly I have considered, and if I say that it goes by six times itself, we require only for the captive power plants 500 gigawatt electricity by 2070. Next slide. Another thing is the steel industry alone. The steel production, if you see, it is growing very steadily. And uh, my projection is that today it is producing something like 100 million tons per year. And it is envisaged to go to 600 to 800 million tons per year by 2070. And if the steel industry will be driven by green hydrogen in place of coal, the hydrogen requirement to produce 600 tons of steel per year will rise to something like 42 million tons of hydrogen per year. And if we need a nuclear power plant to suffice that, it will be huge power required 300 gigawatt only for the captive power plants of steel industry. And majority of them are there in Odisha. I think that the Odisha government and policy makers have to think that Odisha today is one of the largest export, sorry, producer of the steel in the country and who is going to rise significantly almost seven, eight times in the near future. And if these captive power plants today, which are coal driven, have to be produced through hydrogen, green hydrogen, and that has to come only for nuclear power. And the power requirement is going to be huge of the order of 300 gigawatt electric. Next, please. Look at transport sector. Today, almost, I say that 100 million tons of oil equivalent we burn in the transport sector itself. And if the transport will be replaced from oil to hydrogen, which will drive the transport, and also to meet the energy requirement by 2050, assuming will be a 35 trillion dollar economy, the oil energy requirement will be huge. My projection is that only for a modest threefold rise in the energy requirement will cause 300 million tons of oil equivalent by mid of the century. And to produce that, we need 100 million tons of green hydrogen. And if that comes from nuclear, it is huge, something like 3,000 to 4,000 gigawatt of electricity, sorry, 600 gigawatt electricity from nuclear. And if we, that in place of nuclear, suppose we use renewables, the capacity is much more, 3,000 to 4,000 gigawatt electricity, which is beyond even the today's total renewable potential for India. Next slide. Another important thing for India, we all have to worry, is getting the clean drinking water. Today, 2022, the UN has already classified India as a water stressed country and we are going to be a water scarce country very soon. That means the per capita water availability will be below 1000 meter cube per hour. It's all because the rain god gives the same amount of water whether it is 1947 or 2047. The per capita energy availability of water is exponentially decreasing because of the rising population. And the only option for the survivability of India is to desaline the seawater. And that also requires huge amount of energy, especially green energy. If one to 6,000 meter cube of day per day of clean water, the energy requirement will be 6,000 meter cube. Next, sorry, one megawatt. Nuclear power, where are we and what we target till 2050? Today, we have very small amount of nuclear energy in the country. Is it hardly anything? I said 22 reactors operating, only 7 gigawatt produced by 2031. We envisage 22 gigawatt to make by mid of the century. There is a projection, something like 50 to 100 gigawatt in may happen. But 
if want to reach a 35 trillion dollar economy by mid of the century the clean energy requirement with the order of 40000 terawatt hour which i said and if i convert into nuclear it's all the order of 5000 gigawatt electric this is apart from full utilization of the renewables so you utilize the full renewables still you will require a huge amount of nuclear power if you want to reach a 35 trillion dollar economy next and what is the choice one of the i will say that the small modular reactors smrs this may drive faster clean energy transition for india apart from the conventional reactors this is all because these reactors are factory assembled small size reactors the investment is smaller upfront capital is smaller and this construction cost is also smaller because they are mainly built in the factory and directly installed in the site so these reactors could be game changer especially for the clean energy transition they can be used in the captive power plants or ipp and especially retiring coal plants can be replaced by these small modular reactors and america and other european countries are taking a strong drive to deploy this type of uh, reactors for the energy transition next what i have done i have found out what is the potential of these reactors for electricity production in our existing coal plant sites some survey i have done next for example you look at talcher thermal power station there is already some uh, thermal power plants have retired which was producing 460 megawatt they have retired if that same site is converted to smr this can produce something like 600 megawatt next slide guru govind ropor thermal power station it is producing 1260 megawatt the whole site if can be converted to smr park it can produce 14800 megawatt next slide even our nalco captive power plant we try to also replace the existing coal with nuclear my assessment is that even though existing coal can be totally replaced by smrs and also there is room to add for additional power in the same site next in uh, south of uh, india there is a place called upur in in uh, tamil nadu and uh, initially there was a site given exclusively for the coal plant because transporting coal from uh, eastern india to southern india is very expensive so the site is still barren so my assessment is that if the same site can be converted to a smr park almost 12800 megawatt can be produced in the same site next time faraka thermal power station today it is producing 2100 megawatt it can be converted to a smr park also with 2000 megawatt next slide similarly there are many other sites i have uh, uh, tried to assess and found that the existing coal plants can produce much more power if they're transformed to nuclear through smr next slide yeah go down even uh, uh, rajasthan kota thermal power station it produces 1240 megawatt the same site can be converted to a smr site of 3200 megawatt next slide sanjay gandhi thermal power station today it produces 1340 megawatt can be converted to a smr site of 2000 megawatt next slide and in Manuguru, that is in Andhra Pradesh, there is a heavy water plant having the captive site. What we found the same site can be easily, easily converted from coal to HDMI, producing much more power than it consumes. Next. So the advantage of transiting from coal to nuclear is the following. The land is always available. So there is no need of land acquisition. Water body is available. Site survey has been done transport facilities are available so even trained manpower especially for the balance of plant is available that's what the american says if you trans coal to nuclear transition 35 percent of the existing facility can be directly utilized next slide so what is the cost levelized cost of electricity today if you look at supercritical coal it is five rupees 46 paisa per unit of electricity and the same supercritical coal plant, if we use the carbon capture and storage, the cost just gets doubled. 
इलेवन रुपीज सिक्सटीन पैसा नेचुरल गैस टू रुपीज सेवेंटी एट पैसा द मोमेंट आई यूज सी सी एस द कॉस्ट गोज बाई थ्री टाइम्स सोलार पी वी इज वन ऑफ द चीपेस्ट टू रुपीज फोर्टी सेवन पैसा द मोमेंट द बैटरी स्टोरेज कम्स इज इलेवन रुपीज फोर्टी सेवन पैसा विंड टू रुपीज फोर्टी पैसा मोमेंट वो फॉर बैटरी स्टोरेज इज इलेवन रुपीज फोर्टी पैसा न्यूक्लियर टूडे और लाटेस्ट वन इज फाइव रुपीज ट्वेंटी पैसा सो दर इज ए ह्यूज रूम फॉर न्यूक्लियर टू एक्सपांड इन इंडियस एनर्जी ट्रांजिशन नेक्स्ट लाइफ अपार्ट फ्रॉम दिस स्मॉल मॉडुलर रिएक्टर्स रिसेंटली अमेरिका इज स्टार्टिंग वेरी वेरी लार्जली ऑन द माइक्रो रिएक्टर्स माइक्रो रिएक्टर्स मीन द साइज इज वेरी स्मॉल टेन टू ट्वेंटी मेगावर्ट एंड एक्सक्लूसिवली टारगेटेड फॉर ग्रीन हाइड्रोजन प्रोडक्शन and ra rapid this can be utilized especially for india for rapid deployment in northeast region today probably most of you may knowing may not be knowing in northeast region the development is one third of that of average india so lot of energy is required to develop the northeast region and we feel this micro modular reactors can be deployed large scale in northeast region also in isod regions malls hospitals airports for uninterrupted power supply even they are so safe they can be sited next to residential colony and close to national highways and ideal for hydrogen production and uh, how much you will not believe for 1 megawatt electricity it can produce almost 480 kg of hydrogen if you use a standard low temperature electrolysis and much more Like 630 kg, if you go for a high temperature through SMRs and micro reactors. Next slide. So, what is the socio-economic aspects? If you do so much from nuclear, my uh, estimate is that it's not only there is a huge boom in terms of millions of jobs which can be created, which are apart from local welfare development, the money required or investment that will come. in this field is close to 3 to 4 trillion dollar so is a huge investment is waiting and that investment is not only to decarbon the captive power plants decarbon the transport sector as well as replace coal to nuclear next slide and what is the fuel you will not believe for nuclear fuel india has sufficient large storage on its own the first stage which we have we all know that we have very limited natural uranium that produce very small amount 10 gigawatt but the moment we process natural uranium from the spent fuel we get plutonium that has a huge i would say energy potential it can go up the order of 400000 terawatt hour and if we burn thorium with that it's much much larger 1400000 1400000 and if we add all together it is a huge number 1800000 terawatt hour potential only from nuclear using domestic fuel for the next 100 years almost half of this energy deficit can be met through domestic fuel and rest can be done through imported fuel next slide so the accelerating the nuclear power the biggest issue is the public fear radiation phobia nobody wants a nuclear power, power plant in his town or next to his door so there is a book also i wrote on this that why people are afraid of radiation so just i'm going to speak here as you know if you get cancer the person goes to hospital to get radiation to cure the cancer but he has also fear if i get radiation i will get cancer so if uh, so there is a something contrasting thing in this so there are plenty of evidences which i am going to say down the line to say that whether there is a radiation fear is a myth or it's a science next slide what is radiation radiation is nothing something coming elsewhere we all are exposed to ionizing radiation naturally and whether you are indoor outdoor sleeping walking eating traveling every time we are exposed to radiation next slide how radiation is measured is called sievert the unit of radiation is sievert like distance unit we say meters similarly radiation dose is measured in terms of sievert one sievert means one joule of radiation energy 
which is going into one kilogram of the human tissue. One sievert is a big number, so normally it is divided by thousand times called one millisievert. Next slide. How much radiation you normally get? Suppose you go to heart CT scan, you get something like 15 millisievert. Full body CT scan, 10 millisievert. Abdominal X-ray, 4 millisievert and so on. And if you live near a nuclear power plant, the dose is much, much below 1 millisievert. As compared to you get the exposure from a heart CT scan which is 15 millisievert. If you live near a nuclear power plant, in a year, you get less than 1 millisievert. Next slide. Where the fear came from about radiation? All of you know, the fear has started from Hiroshima Nagasaki bombing. In fact, before Hiroshima Nagasaki bombing, radiation was used to cure almost all diseases, which I'm going to speak uh, down the line. But after the Hiroshima Nagasaki bombing, we all know almost 200,000 people died immediately. And uh, everybody thought these 200,000 people died because of radiation. But please remember that there was no radiation measuring devices that time. Nobody knew who has got how much radiation. In fact, researchers in US and Japan worked almost 60 years to create dosimeter. And after a Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombing, no radiation has ever been given to a person to understand if the radiation is given to him, what happens to its DNA? Whether he gets cancer, he gets death, there is no study has been done. Only available study until now is Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombing. Next slide. As I said, 200,000 people died immediately. But what is the energy of the atom bomb? Does it contain 100% radiation? No. 35% of atom bomb comes from heat and light, same as any other explosive. 50% is blast energy, same as any other explosive. Only 15% is nuclear radiation. And out of that 15%, 5% comes immediately, 10% comes very, very late. So it might have so happened that all those 200,000 people died. They died because of not radiation, but because of thermal radiation and blast energy. Next. So what America has done, the people who survived in Japan, their study was taken. And the radiation dose, vis a vis, how many people got cancer and cancerous death, this was studied. And if you see both these broad tables, the left side is leukemia and the right, is, right side is from solid cancer. Broadly what he says, that if the dose is below 200 millisievert, 200 means I say 200 times more than if you live near a nuclear power plant, the risk was found to be negative. What does it mean? What do you mean by negative risk? In the sense, these Japanese people have lived longer as compared to average Japanese people, and they had a lesser risk of cancer death as compared to unexposed Japanese people. Next. In fact, the atom bomb survivors of course, who got high doses, their lifespan was reduced. But those people who received low dose, especially, as I said, less than 200 millisievert, the study shows that their lifespan has increased and they have reduced cancer mortality. Next. Now, I'll, I'll tell you, during the Cold War period, United States, Russia, UK, they conducted thousands of uh, atom bomb studies. And there were several thousands who were involved in making those nuclear weapons and experiments. Did they all die of cancer? So this is the statistics which is which I am presenting here. In the United Kingdom, 1950 to 60s, those who were involved in the atom bomb test, they showed no discernible impact on their mortality or probability of developing cancer or other fatalities. And even during the following seven year follow-up, it was found that they had very, very, I'll say that almost 
ਦੇਖੋ ਜੀ ਸਬਲੀ ਕਾਮ ਮੇ ਆ ਮਾਈਲੋ ਮੇ ਆ ਵਰ ਮਚ ਮਚ ਲੋਰ ਐਜ਼ ਕੰਪੇਅਰਡ ਟੂ ਨੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਐਵਰੇਜ ਇਵਨ ਆਸਟ੍ਰੇਲੀਅਨਸ ਹੂ ਟੂਕ ਪਾਰਟ ਇਨ ਦ ਬ੍ਰਿਟਿਸ਼ ਨਿਊਕਲੀਅਰ ਐਕਸਪੈਰੀਮੈਂਟਸ ਡਿਡ ਨਾਟ ਸ਼ੋ ਐਨੀ ਐਵੀਡੈਂਸ ਆਫ ਥੈਮ ਗੈਟਿੰਗ ਮੋਰਟੈਲਿਟੀ ਬਿਕੋਜ਼ ਆਫ ਥਿਸ ਨੈਕਸਟ ਸਲਾਈਡ ਆਪਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਪਲੰਬਮ ਥਿਸ ਵਾਸ ਕੰਡਕਟਡ ਬਾਈ ਯੂਨਾਈਟਿਡ ਸਟੇਟਸ ਦੇ ਹੈਵ ਅ ਡੈਜ਼ਰਟ ਕਾਲਡ ਦ ਨੇਵਾਦਾ ਡੈਜ਼ਰਟ ਵੇਅਰ ਦੇ ਡੂ 올 ਸੋਰਟਸ ਆਫ ਵੈਪਨ ਟੈਸਟ and several thousands were involved in this test and these guys were tested and they were found that those who were involved in the nuclear weapon test they had a lower mortality rate than the american population and they were sufficiently healthy 53 years after the exposure in the united ussr semi platonic where almost 20000 soldiers were taken that what has happened to them they were all involved in this uh, atom of the earth uh, in the nuclear test and they were exposed to a huge dose 20 millisievert to 4000 millisievert and the results showed that no significant dose response connection for a, any cardiovascular illness heart disease or stroke next slide three accidents have happened until now in the history of nuclear power plant the first one has happened in three mile island united states in which because the nuclear reactor has several containments to confine the radioactive release only 0.01% of the fission products released to the environment which was a hardly 10 to 70 curie there was no adverse health effects from the accident next slide however governor of pennsylvania he was scared almost 144000 people he evacuated and those who evacuated they had the rate of cancer in and around that area was found to be insignificantly small but the public fear still remains next slide chernobyl was the next 1986 happened and it's much severe than the tmi2 in fact the amount of radioactive products released was much much higher than the hiroshima bomb next slide and the administration got scared 116000 people they evacuated because of panic and social uh, dislocation and that caused more death not the radiation itself because people especially old people were asked to evacuate they had already the pre existing diseases such people because of panic and stress they die next and uh, you will not believe the amount of a dose in spite of such a uh, i'll say that worst accident was less than 100 millisievert which is much less than i said the number those who received less than 200 millisievert in uh, hiroshima and nagasaki their lifespan was found to be longer and they had less risk of cancer death and in uh, chernobyl the maximum dose which people received was hardly 100 millisievert there is no evidence of them having diseases like cancer and recently you'll find the bottom most one the wolves who live in chernobyl have to be found that they have become resistant to cancer in a 2006 bbc documentary it was revealed that those wildlife who were surviving who were living there were surviving flora fauna signing so the place has become a wonderful place for the habitat next the fukushima accident happened few years back 2011 how many people died not a single person died only three on on site workers died because of earthquake and tsunami no fatalities have happened because of radiation because the dose which public received was very small 7.7 millisievert and up to 250 millisievert was the largest but when the dose was just 1 millisievert the japanese government decided to evacuate 200000 people and that caused 600 non radiological deaths because of the uh, impact of uh, transporting or shifting these people from their house to a shelter so next next slide so mortality on the other hand what it was found the mortality risk of residents in nursing homes those who were evacuated what 2.7 times more than the people who lived there before the accident is all because the dose was very very small so people who lived there they did have any death on the other hand those who were shifted they died almost three times more than those who stayed back next slide i'll show you some beautiful studies in taipei the capital of taiwan almost 1700 flats were constructed 
with steel contaminated with a radioactive material called cobalt 60. And people lived, almost 10,000 people lived in this apartment for 20 years and they got a huge dose of 400 millisievert. Then it was detected. So there was fear these guys might get cancer or death. But on the other hand, the residents were found to be healthy and they had cancer deaths lesser by 3% than the average Taiwanese people. Next. There is an interesting study. One gentleman called Ian Sheetar used to play in uranium mines in Canada along with his friends collecting the radioactive samples. So his friend said that, oh, you, are, you people are going to get problems later in, in, uh, in life. On the other hand, what he found that, uh, that they were all healthy and they had no chance of cancer. Even uh, the mod pack, which was effective in removing arthritis and plantar wart pain. This is a very, very interesting thing. His cat had developed an allergy and because of this radiation, self-radiation, it improved. Next. Lessi Kouris, he used to use a uranium necklace from Nighthawk Minerals for five years. And he claims since then, he never had cold upper respiratory tract infection. He says that he, everyone who wears one of the uranium necklace will have a significant healthier society. Another gentleman called 1982, Luke, was the first to conclude that low dose radiation benefit animal growth development, health and longevity. He also recommends that construction of meeting rooms next to nuclear power plants, where the dose should be 100 millisievert per day. One milligram means 100 millisievert per day. And use of monazite for radon rooms used for therapy and prevention. Next. This is beautiful slide. The National Geog Geography started moving around the world to find out where in the world people live the longest. And they found there is an island called Ikaria, which is located 30 miles from the coast of Turkey. And here, the siblings live average life of 90 plus, which is much more than that of Europe and America. Why they live so longer? Because the islanders live and bath in an environment high in radon and radium. Next slide. And Sokolov, the another scientist, who also reported pain relief in patients with arthritis using x-rays. And also he describes cell stimulation and successful treatment of some of the chronic inflammatory conditions using x-ray. During 1930s, wide variety of inflammatory and infection diseases used to be created, used to be cured or treated by x-rays and radium gamma rays for a dose of 0.5 to 2 gray which is a huge number, 2 grade is 2,000 millisievert. Simple calculations show that no morbidity and annual saving of millions of life in the world if low dose radiation is given to them for prevention and treating of inflammatory diseases as a much smaller fraction of today's cost. Next slide. Asthma used to be treated in 1926 by ionizing radiation. The list of diseases which could be cured by low dose radiation include arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, neuralgia, spondylitis, bursitis, you would name any disease, it is all here, asthma, diabetes, hypertension, hepatitis, Parkinson disease, and so on and so forth. High radiation doses used to be given to control bone pain from cancer, 80 gray, and nerve pain also is to be controlled by giving radiation. Next. And there is every indication that even HIV AIDS could be cured if low dose radiation is given. And there is a lot of, uh, I'll say that evaluation studies have been done using mice if, uh, that uh, if you give a dose of something like 1.5 milligram uh, for certain days, the friend virus is to get cured. Next slide. Even cardiovascular related chronic disease they were found that no unexpected risk of cancer, cancer is to be reported that the staff who works in the cardiac arthritis laboratory and they receive a median cumulative radiation of 46 milligram. So there is a uh, saying that good way to reduce heart damage is to give a low conditioning dose of 150 milligram a day. Next slide. So diabetes, if you see, 
that low dose cumulative radiation less than 500 milligray doesn't appear to be involved with kidney, cardiovascular system, and abnormal lipid profiles and diabetes. There was no statistically significant effects of cardiovascular disease in humans. Suppose cumulative dose of 500 milligray at dose of 10 milligray per day is given. Even there is plenty of evidence that diabetic mice which are given the dose at a particular uh, rate, they were found to be sufficiently healthy. And in fact, these all helped to reduce the inflammation, insulin resistance, lipid profile, and also prevention of nephropathy. Next slide. And there are more than 100 research publications to support that low dose radiation, how it benefits the human, human system, tumor cells, diabetes, and stochastic effects. Next slide. Having said so much, so good about radiation, there is a big question. Why people are afraid of radiation? Because when people think about nuclear, they don't think about all those good things I spoke. They only think about nuclear warheads, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Chernobyl, Fukushima, and cancer. So the public's fear of cancer with radiation, this is connected with the leading cause of fear. But let me tell you, the public paradigm that nuclear radiation is a carcinogen is a political, scientific misinterpretation and cherry picking than the actual science. In fact, governments used the fear of radiation as an effective weapon during the Cold War, and that has resulted collateral damage to public morale about radiation. Next slide. Who is, who is the culprit and what is the culprit? The root cause of fear is a theory called linear no threshold theory in the sense biological damage is proportional to radiation dose. Zero dose means you will never get cancer. As the dose increases, the, there is a, the probability of getting cancer is also linearly increases. And this is the most misinterpreted science or misrepresented science, which is presented as a fact despite all those evidences which I spoke before it. Next. Who is the man behind that? The man behind this is a German scientist called Muller, who was against all this uh, nuclear weapon test. What he did, just after the discovery of X-ray induced mutations, he started describing a linear no threshold theory by conducting experiments in fruit flies, where he put a lot of dose to find the mutations in them. And then, if you could prove mutation in fruit flies, he said that also human beings, such mutations can happen. And that is why he built up a theory called linear no threshold theory. And later on, all communities in the world, including the chemical industry, in nuclear regulatory industry, they adopted that theory, except one country, which is France. That is why 75% of electricity in, in France comes from nuclear. Next slide. What is this uh, theory? What does it ignore? As I said, there is only one evidence in the world that is the Hiroshima Nagasaki bombing. The people's dose data, vis a vis, who got how much cancer or deaths due to cancer. So, what he did, he plotted x axis, the radiation dose, y axis, excess relative risk of cancer of those survivors of the Japanese people. And what he did, he plotted them and joined by a straight line and removed all those data which was not falling in that straight line. What is those data? I have shown in green there at the bottom. You see the next slide. Next slide, those data are given. If you see up to 0.4 gray x-axis, the y-axis shows the extra relative risk of cancer. The risk is negative in the sense the y-axis, the data falls below zero. In the sense, until up to 0.4 gray, that is 400 millisievert, or even 200 millisievert, I will say, which 0.2 gray, the risk was negative in the sense, as I said, the Japanese people, those who are exposed to less than 200 millisievert, their life long, its lo lifespan is longer, and they had negative risk of cancer, which this guy omitted all this data and made the linear no threshold theory. Next. And then what happened? I think we we'll go to the next slide. Yeah. So what is the biggest controversy in this theory? 
that Muller got Nobel Prize. And he also knew prior to his Nobel Prize data that what he said was wrong because there was some evidence that until and unless the dose is above certain thing, this risk was negative. In fact, there are plenty of insects and uh, who are exposed even to 1 to 30,000 rem of radiation, what is found that the lifespan increases 20 to 60 percent. And exposure at egg and larva stable also has found that at most low doses, that's 10 to 100 are the longevity of the lifespan of the uh, exposed, uh, exposure increases. And more studies in fruit flies have shown that X and gamma ray doses as low as 200 milligram to X significantly increase the adult fly longevity. Next slide. So the biggest controversy is here only. The Standard Oil Company was founded by John Rockefeller in 1870, who later established the Rockefeller Foundation in 1913. Muller had close ties with this foundation. In 1954, this foundation chose to finance a large group to evaluate ionizing radiation. The genetic panels of the National Academy of Science, Biological Effects of Atomic Radiation, called Beer Committee, was established in 1954, and it was not chaired by a scientist, but by a mathematician called Weaver, and who had, was also director of the foundation. So there was no discussion. Muller was part of this committee. No discussion. This committee recommended Muller's theory of linear natural theory. The dose limit to nuclear workers was 500 milligram per year. Before that, this was discarded the same day. Next day, the front page of New York Times, it was published, which is owned by the same trustee that radiation is dangerous. And then other media followed the suit. And that's how the fossil fuel uh, came up and nuclear energy was made as something like a scary to the public. Next. So that is why I said, if you see the living nuclear plants, we have made some dose criteria. It should not be more than one millisievert per year. And today, most of the nuclear power plants in India, the dose is even thousand times of that allowable limit. It's so small. And at what cost? We have to put layers after layers after layers so that radiation doesn't come to the public and electricity goes up. Next slide. This is my last slide. The biggest question is, are we radiation deficient today? We all have to discover and find a new room. I see that this is a beautiful slide. I always love it that many thousand years ago, the human beings used to live in forest along with animals and birds. Once there was fire and the animals, birds flew away because of the heat of the fire. But human beings felt the heat of fire and they utilized it and that's how the civilization started. Nuclear has enormous heat. Time has come. If you want to sustain a $35 trillion economy, there is no other way except putting our steps into that. Thank you all for giving me the chance to speak.